morning and afternoon, everyone. Um, so this presentation is just intended as a sort of like fairly high level overview of how we're using Pulp3 in our environment. Um, I don't get into specifics per se. Um, if we've got time at the end, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, but for anyone that's looking to use Pulp3, um, I thought it might be of some use. Ah, here you go. <clears throat> As I said, uh, so we're mainly using it for RPM content. We do have aspirations, but for now it is just RPM. Uh, this probably should have come before the last slide. Um, so Linux admin, 20 plus years of experience, recently transitioned to Python development. Um, the the implementation of the Pulp3 uh, installation was interesting, to say the least. Um, the, the lack of native RPMs was, was problematic for us. Um, we ended up having to build them ourselves. Um, we didn't particularly want to use a container solution. Um, a large part of that is just the, the company that we work in or I work in has not massively adopted the cloud yet. Um, so it's not the de facto standard. There's still a, a learning experience for us there and it's a bit of a paradigm shift. So we decided to stick with what we knew. Um, Uh, so, why we wanted to use Pulp, um, historically, uh, it would have been the traditional repo sync to pull the content down, um, tens of dumb directories with elaborate hard links to um, optimize disk space, uh, create repo and rsync to distribute those repositories around, and of course, it's RPMs only, and by RPM, I do just mean RPM. Um, we wouldn't have had access to any of the Avata information or anything along those lines. Um, the other option, of course, is third-party products, which were just painful to use uh, from my personal experience. So we chose something that's more natural, a more natural fit, um, which was Pulp, the first iteration being Pulp 2. Um, what we were looking to achieve um, was very much something that we could take and adapt to our own usage scenarios, um, something that we could program against. So by default, we only really go for things that have uh, an API that allows us to modify it and fit in with our own tooling. Um, as I said, something that was flexible. So there are other products out there. Um, some of them also use Pulp. But there's a certain expectation as to what, say, a promotional path would be um, for a package that needed to get out into the wild. Um, certainly in the past, that, that flow didn't work for us. We wanted the ability to be flexible. Um, again, can work with our existing tooling. By that, I mean the programming language. So for us, it was very much uh, Python-based. Um, and then the usual things along the lines of uh, efficient use of storage and it being extensible, providing authentication and authorization, and to facilitate the patching of our estate. So as I mentioned earlier on in the introduction, um, our first attempt was very much with Pulp 2. Um, so this is just to give a, a rough idea of, of that experience. Um, I'll leave the first point to anyone that wants to read it. Um, the biggest issue that we had with Pulp2 was just the time it takes to publish the repositories. Um, the fact that there was no versioning natively um, to fit in with our notional release cycle, we effectively had to duplicate our repos, which meant copying all of the content um, from one repo to another, and then publishing it. Um, that needed to be done at the time of creating the release. It couldn't be done beforehand. 
Um, so our release process started off at two hours when we sort of like went uh, went into production with Pulp 2, but by the time we moved to Pulp 3, it had actually grown to six hours um, due to the number of repos that we had and the amount of content that was being created. Um, I'm fairly certain that there was additional slowdown there due to the amount of data that we had, um, but I wasn't familiar enough to, with Mongo to even begin debugging that. And by that time, uh, Pulp 2 was end of life, so it wasn't something that I thought it would be worthwhile wasting anyone's time on. Um, it was a good learning experience. It let us solidify what a release for us looked like. And I can go into that in more detail later on if anyone's interested. Um, but it was certainly a good learning experience for us. So from our perspective, um, when we went to Pulp 3, uh, we got a bunch of stuff for free. Um, the main bit was it was a blank canvas um, that allowed us to, to do whatever we wanted, um, including possibly hang ourselves at times. Um, but it was flexible, um, which I very much appreciated. The introduction of the the libraries the client libraries was a massive benefit from my perspective um i didn't have to mess around with requests and wrappers for requests in my own code and attempt probably badly to make it clean um, being able to just use native libraries was really really useful um, and having the the browser interface to be able to view what those offered was also exceptionally useful um, i really as a general rule i really enjoyed working with it there were a couple of issues but on the whole it was it was enjoyable um, a big thing for us was the the native versioning of the repositories we had to cut some corners with pulp 2 um, because of that um, but with Pulp 3, it, it's just there. Um, there are some additional things that we'd like, um, which has been discussed previously. So things like branching in the versions um, for notional merges into old releases. But aside from that, it's worked really well for us. And then um, some other things that we got with Pulp 2. So, you know, efficient use of storage, um, the single tool chain for multiple content types and Pulp 3, I believe, offers more plugins than Pulp 2 did. Um, and it would be interesting to, to write our own um, if we ever get the time to do that. Um, everything you'd expect with management of RPM repositories, we get for free. Um, so the syncing and the publishing, um, the validation of the um, MD5 checksums or any checksum. Um, and I have to say, an exceptionally supportive team. Um, not to be a suck up, but it's been an absolute pleasure working with you guys and girls on um, IRC. It's, it's been really, really enjoyable, and you've been exceptionally helpful. And I don't think uh, that can go um, unsaid. So what did we have to do when we went to Pulp 3? Uh, more than I thought. Um, so learning the new terminology, not a biggie, um, but if you're coming from Pulp 2, it's worthwhile getting your head around the changes um, in terminology. Um, there's, there's a couple of small things in there that if you can get your head, head around it, I think it makes a big difference to, to working with Pulp 3, um, especially the, the fact that in Pulp 2, you would just have a repo and distributors and publications are all tied into it with pulp 3 they're they're completely separate objects that are managed and dealt with independently um, re-implementing the things that we got for free with pulp admin uh, so when i started on this journey probably it's good that that was the case um, there was no equivalent to pulp admin so even the small things needed to be written ourselves um, against the API. And that that's not a small amount of work. Um, 
so that that took up a, a lot of my initial interaction with it and, and in fairness probably slowed down the time to test things and get my head around things because um, often certainly as a as a historic administrator it's more interacting via cli command interfaces that i would have learned the the platform and then everything else which i shall cover so i suppose this is the the meat of the presentation um which is around the tooling um that i had to write to to work within our infrastructure um so obviously creating the different types of repositories which would include things like the authentication and um, methods <coughs> the type of mirrors um, deleting listing and updating um, especially the updating so as uh, certificates change and get updated being able to edit your repository definitions um, needs to be done and again controlling their synchronization um, which is more complex than you'd think um, if you're in an enterprise environment you can find that you're stuck on a repo that's no longer published upstream and you don't want to be causing noise on a nightly sync run for repos that have disappeared um, so you need ways of controlling things like that so that you can cleanly sync um, and get rid of error messages um, content so adding your content moving content between repositories um, it's probably worthwhile so on that one specifically uh, we've got a notion of an upstream repo uh, which we consider dirty it's a verbatim copy of whatever's published by a third party and then we've got a notion of a trunk repo um, and that trunk repo is curated by us we will copy data from upstream into trunk they are explicitly the link is explicitly broken so we needed tooling to be able to move the content between those two um, similarly deleting content people accidentally upload an rpm or it uh, turns out there's a malicious rpm that has a rootkit from uh, a particular um, third party being able to delete that content and the artifact associated with it um, and of course finding content will will often have users saying that they're looking for a particular rpm um, how do you find that if you've got hundreds of repos um, and many versions of repos and similarly uh, deleting how do you know where you need to delete that content from uh, monitoring of the tasks um, being able to know whether a task is stuck um, we've had issues with syncing where a, a sync will last many days and it just seems to to be stuck because i'm assuming um, the remote end had an issue though it could be us um, being able to track that down being able to cancel it um, being able to see specific details around the tasks that may be stuck or about a sync that may have failed being able to see why that happened um, again the lack of the cli at the time of writing this meant that we had to do all of this ourselves and then release management um, so the big thing for us was being able to control what content gets into our production estate and how it gets there um, so the the bulk of the scripts that we wrote was specifically in and around this um, the merging into a release was quite a big thing so we would tend to run uh, release a and release b um, release uh, and they iterate through a week or two weeks um, with the old release being replaced with the new release every so often we might have a package that we need to either add or remove 
to both releases, working out how to do that, working out how to work with the versions within the, the pulp repositories, um, being able to see what was done. Um, so on a during our release meeting, we would review what packages have made into specific repos that we particularly care about. There might be other repos that we don't care what gets into it. For example, let's say Fedora, we would just ingest all patches without any verification. Um, we trust upstream. Um, so we don't want to review that, but well, server, we definitely do want to know what's going into it. So writing the tooling to be able to do that, um, processing the errata, um, that was a fairly large piece of work for us. And global distribution. So we've got circa 6,000 hosts, not a huge number, um, but it's, uh, they're hosted around the globe. We want local access for those systems for build so that it doesn't take too long. Um, and uh, in the event of network connectivity issues or anything, we can run independently. Um, so again, the tooling needed to work out how to do that, how to push and publish and make sure that everything's in sync. Part three problems. Um, I'll be honest, we didn't really have significant issues. I think the biggest issue we had was the tasking system. Um, and it was amazingly fortuitous that you guys had um, already fixed it before I hit it. Um, so that that was amusing, um, I would say. But that that was probably the the biggest issue that we had. Outside of that, we still have issues with authentication and authorization. Part of that is down to our implementation of using um, a different reverse proxy. Um, but that's something that I'm going to have to spend a bit of time on to to make sure that it is in place. Um, from an Ongoing issue, uh, time to generate reports is a problem for us. I know that I've spoken to some, some of you in the past. So we get a report of everything that's in a release um, and we store that offline for different reasons. At the moment, that takes um, probably 25 minutes to generate all of that data for all of the different repos that we have. Um, and then finally, uh, something that we've not got around to doing is removing bad content for good. Um, at the moment, we're able to remove it from a release, um, which just generates a new version where that content isn't present. Um, I don't believe we have any rootkits, but if we ever found a rootkit in our content, we would want that removed entirely from the environment. Um, and that would be quite time consuming to do, I believe, um, making sure that all versions that have the content in it, it's been removed. And once it finally has purging the artifact, um, I think it would be nice if there was a, an easier way to uh, locate that data um, in all of the different repositories and associated versions. Uh, what next for us? Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, we were looking for an organic solution that will grow with us. Um, I believe we've got that. Uh, so I'm sure that quite a few things will come up. Um, but first on those list is adopting the file and container plugins. We've got immediate requirements for that. Um, writing our own LexD image. Um, plugin would probably be quite useful for us or um, adapting the container plugin if applicable. Um, we've not had any time to look at that yet. Um, general tooling improvements and something that's probably quite high on the list is housekeeping. Um, so doing things like clearing down the tasks, um, entry the table. We don't do anything along those lines. Um, and I think, that's it, just questions. I mean, I have to ask, uh, I'm guessing you use the, the Ansible installer. How nope. did, 
you said you you, you, so you installed it manually. Yep. Okay, because I to be honest with you, our manual instructions have multiple missions. Like we update the installer, but we don't update the manual instructions. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It, it it was it was a bit of a journey. Um, so the biggest issue is just the the multitude of Python modules that are needed. I think by the time I finished doing the initial RPM builds, I got to about 115 different RPMs that needed to be built. Yeah, um, which was painful. Um, but the thing is, we we very much want to own the the infrastructure. Um, yeah. and understand what packages are being updated, when they're being updated, and have complete control over that. Right. Um, yeah, and I do want to point out, like in 2019, I started on creating RPM patches for Pulp and getting them into Fedora, uh, but I shifted gears to working on the operator, which is seen as much higher priority. And I mean, there's also being, but, and then, and then, Eventually, the the foreman team started creating RPMs for their specific need and their specific yep. set of plugins. And if it was if I was doing it now, I well, I would certainly look at the foreman uh, RPMs to see if they were suitable for us. Yeah. But when we started on this journey, which was the beginning of twenty twenty, I think there were no packages available. Yes. Um, right. So we had no choice. I see. Yeah, and and just to clarify one thing, these are the, the you know the the state of both RPMs. If we were actually to deliver them, would be they would be usable by pulp installer, meaning pulp installer would do all the configuration rather than configuration being in scriptlets and stuff like yep. that. That that that's fine. Uh, again, for us, we wouldn't be using the inst installer. We'd be using our own config management. Um, I did use the installer as a, an initial kind of pointer as to what needs changing and what needs updating. Things like the um, service files or the, sorry the unit files for system D. Um, but all of that we would use our own configuration management for which, which we do. Great. Yep. And obviously, the onus is on us to make sure that we keep a pace with um, changes in upstream. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Grant and Grant, Brian. have you, Brian, have you questions? Oh, um, just a quick question. Um, you mentioned 6,000 hosts. Can you give us a ballpark for how many repositories are important to you and how many how many distributed versions of those repositories do you are part of your daily operations? Just to get a ballpark for the scale we're talking about? Yeah, sure. So as part of our release, we have roughly so on a normal um, day. Uh, or cycle, we've got about 115, 120 repos that constitute to release. Um, of those, we only really, really care about maybe 10 of them, um, maybe 15 at most. Uh, during a rebase phase, uh, that will double in size. Um, and during a period when we're going, for example, at the moment, we're going from L7 to L8, uh, there's a, a significant uptick. Um, with regards to the number of active distributors that we have at the moment, I've lost count, but I think we're at around 50,000 to 60,000. That is not, those are not all needed. Uh, that would also fit into housekeeping. So we only really need probably, um, I think anything more than six weeks of releases, I don't believe we need. Um, and we only really, really care about the active two. The, it would be a very bad day if we had to point to a release that was three, four, five weeks old. Um, any one release can have, I think the most we've seen is 25 um, merges to fix issues. Um, so that would be 
110, 115 repos or distributors times 25. Um, and then you've got two weeks of that. So it, even though the current 50 odd thousand is a very, very high number, we would still see large numbers of distributors in play. Thank you. Is this because, so you need so many old ones around because you have machines that still rely on those? No, because I've not written the code to clean it up. Okay. Um, so our, our general approach to a release is um, we, so as I mentioned, we've got upstream, um, we only ever have one distributor per upstream repo. We then have our notional trunk repo um, the, you could think of it a bit like a subversion. Um, all of our changes go into trunk. Um, and then we have a release meeting where we review all of the changes in trunk since the previous release. Um, your versioning makes it very easy to work that out, by the way. Um, so we review all of those changes, packages that have been added, packages that have been removed, new repositories that have been presented or repos that have been removed. Um, we would, assuming everything's okay, um, we would then generate a new distributor that would point to the publish, uh, the publisher that's uh, for that trunk version. Um, and then if we needed to make any changes in our estate, be it in the repository or our configuration management code base, we would then create a patched release. So it would be a 01, 02, 03, 04. And we keep all of those point releases around for the lifetime of the release. Thank you. You're welcome. Brian, I think. Uh, yeah, um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll limit it to one so everybody can have a chance. Um, the you mentioned global distribution um so these are you know how many like points of presence are you yep. um do you have if you don't mind sharing that and then how do you are those also running pulp in them or do you try to have one big system and and if they're separate how do you sync them and maybe sure. you can just talk a little bit about global, global distribution sure so in Pulp 2, we had about eight Pulp instances. In Pulp 3, we've shrunk that down to five instances for now. Um, they are completely independent versions of Pulp. And the tooling that we wrote is responsible for making sure that they're in sync. Um, so as a general rule, we do all of our work on the notional master um, or primary. Um, make sure that a release looks the way we expect it to look. And then on all of the secondaries, we just sync the content. Um, similarly, when we're creating repos, we need to create the repository on the primary um, with its upstream data pointing to whatever upstream is. And then once that's done, we go off to the secondaries and we create the repositories there and make sure that the content synced across. So all of that's done within our tooling, um, but they're all standalone pulp instances. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so Ina, you have a question? Um, yeah, a quick one. Um, on one of your slides, you mentioned that you have future plans to use other plugins. However, you have some predefined requirements. Uh, can you expand a little bit on what kind of requirements you have in place? Maybe the ones oh. we still don't have, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> worked yeah. out in place already. So from a requirements, it's not so much um, requirements on of the plugin. It's just the plugins as they are now we know we want to use them. So uh, some of the content that we distribute uh, would be, for example, VMware Horizon. Um, those packages are ugly binary blobs. Instead of putting those into our revision control system, 
um, or trying to do an RPM wrapper around it and deal with the, the VMware installer, we would just put that in a file repository, being able to distribute ISOs internally. Um, there, there's, a, there's a whole slew of, of reasons why we'd want to use that. Um, and the other one is just the container plugin we're currently working um, with and around Docker and Podman. So we're looking to utilize um, the container plugin and have that fit in with our generic release process. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Inga. So, Matthias, I believe you have a question um, also. Yeah, uh, when you say release, do you uh, merge all packages that constitute a release into a single repository to publish? Or do you have tooling to publish multiple repositories at the same time and distributors or and add the distributors for them? Uh, so I think I understood the question. Um, we keep all of the repositories separate in their own, let's say, swim lanes. Um, and a release would be if we've got 100 repos that are notionally trunk, um, we would have 100 distributors created at the point of release, pointing to the publisher for trunk at that point in time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, Mike, um, I believe you have yep. your hand up. So, could you describe your deployment or configuration method? Like, are you using Puppet or Chef or something like that? Or are you using shell scripts? Salt. Salt. Yeah. Got you. Any more questions for Douglas? Um, I had a bit of a side chat with um, Robin, and she's OK if there are other questions or discussion points that you want to bring up now. We have a bit of time. Go for it, Brian. All right. Um, I have. Uh, Two questions are very much kind of related. Um, uh, do you, how many users interact with Pulp, Pulp's API? Is it that you work with, you mentioned like going to meetings and reviewing packages. Is this like, um, you know, how many users are interacting with it? Not as many as we'd like. Um, and a large part of that is down to the authentication authorization element. Um, at the moment, it's just our core, by and large, our core systems administration team. Um, so users would be responsible for maybe creating spec files that they want for RPMs being built. We would build it and upload it. Um, so you're only really, from, from an admin perspective, you're only really looking at maybe 10 or 12 users. Mm -hmm. um, that are doing it. We would like that to be extended out quite substantially, um, but obviously can't do that until the authentication and authorization elements are in place. Um, I did look at that previously, but doing it natively within Django for Kerberos and IPA did not strike me as straightforward at all. Um, yeah. And looking at the examples, I think you're predominantly using the reverse proxy has the authentication and passing that on to um, Pulp to do the authorization. Um, unfortunately, our reverse proxy doesn't support that. Um, so we need to retool internally um, away from HA proxy. Cool. Um, that sounds great. Uh, I was this, I want I wanted to ask about authentication. Um, you know, when we do bring uh, kind of eventually, hopefully soon, um, build out the authorization and the role-based access control for all the API endpoints. Um, did you have an external authentication system that you would want it to connect to? Um, and IPA. I hear you. IPA, so, IDM. IPA, IDM. Okay. Yep. Um, and I guess my last 
question for now, at least, is um, if we had a user interface, um, would there be would that be at all valuable to um, your goal of having more users, of having more users use the system directly, or is it strict API access? That's what worked well for you all, and that's what you're going to continue using. Depends what the GUI offered, um, because we're fairly heavily customized and we've got a reasonably comprehensive set of scripts to, to work with it. Um, I don't think we would want to manage changes um, outside of that script, but maybe uh, a GUI that provides visibility as to what packages are available and where, um, what repos are available, versions, if a user is looking for a particular file, how that would fit in with, say, the, the container plugins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There, there might be something there, um, and possibly for admins, um, our tooling is rough around the edges in certain places. Um, so being able to look at the tasks that are open um, and navigate those tasks and the resources and created resources, that would be quite useful, I think. Um, I certainly still find myself dropping into a, um, an IPython session frequently um, if there's an issue with, the, with any of the tasks. I have to jump on IPython to interrogate the system a bit more. Um, I think the, there is a GUI, a notional GUI for it, um, but it is but ugly with our RPMs. I think the CSS um, is a little bit broken uh, for us, and I'm not entirely certain why. I think there's a, a ticket open about that one. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any last questions, Les? I actually do have one more. Um, sorry. Uh, can you give some anecdotal, maybe an, an impression of the performance between Pulp 2 <laughs> and Pulp 3? I mean, you mentioned like six hours was like the kind I, of runtime. I did mean to do that um, when I said it and forgot it by the end of the slides. So, our, as I said, our release was was notoriously bad um, at the six hour mark. It is now, if we remove the reports element, it takes about 45 seconds. Um, when you add the reports in, it goes from 45 seconds to about 20, 25 minutes. And obviously the, the biggest change there is the fact that the publications are happen happening um, at the time of content being uploaded and has nothing to do with the release process whatsoever. Um, so that's just that that's just the time it takes to write the to raise the API calls and to come back and stuff like that. Um, it, it's it's night and day. Thank you. Yeah, and the reporting is slow is because the, you're querying the content API, right? And you have to paginate yeah. through all those results. Correct. Yeah. And, and I am, I have limited the content that I'm looking for uh, to the bare minimum um, that each uh, content types able to return. Um, but even then, it, it's, it's very, very slow, relatively speaking. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you're just doing lookups, so I can definitely see yeah. how this is uh, very slow. I do owe Grant um, some numbers around that. Um, he did ask me for some about six weeks, two months ago, and I've just not had a chance to, to do it. Yeah, it seems to me like we need some new APIs for uh, uh, this kind of data reporting. And, and for reference, the, the main reason why we're doing that is if, the, if, if things go really badly and we just lose our pulp instances or the databases are corrupted or anything along those lines, we've got minimal information along the lines of NEVRA and ERATA IDs that we're able to reconstruct the repositories. Yep. Um, 
and yeah just having that offline we we feel is valuable do you, do you run those queries in parallel yes that's an interesting problem we should yeah yeah, yeah, I'm telling you, like, uh, he, we've talked about this on chat before. And yeah, you know, yep. I feel like we should uh, look into this and bring yeah. the experience around this. There's yeah. a couple of there's a couple of layers of, of ways to attack this. And, you know, Douglas, don't feel bad for not having gotten those numbers to me, because <laughs> if you had, I would have forgotten you'd given them to me because there's been so much going on. So but there's there's a lot to do here. And hearing your real world experience reinforces how important it is in a way that's separate from the day-to-day -day existence as a developer of pulp because i don't have you know 50,000 distrib distributors that i have to deal with um and so oh it only takes a second yes but the zeros add up and that's where it's really important to hear this so uh, thank you this has been this has been great i don't i'm just speaking for myself this has been outstanding welcome um, I have one more question. Um, this is so great. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, we had a lot of discussion from various users of Pulp about what is the right way to handle this like malware example. Um, or say you have a, you know, you discover a rootkit in a particular package. Um, one of the ways that we've discussed is like, it's this search and destroy thing where you know, make it easy for users to report all the versions where something is contained and then make it easy for them to delete all of those things. The other option is more like what people tend to say is a yank where um, you don't delete the, say the repository versions containing that, which you would have to do in order to actually delete it from pulp. But you just kind of, cor you corrupt or remove the binary data in a way that perhaps pulp could indicate uh, this package was yanked. This is like what PyPy does, and I believe Ruby gems as well. Um, do you have a, do you have an opinion or um, a perspective on which of these approaches would be a, the best fit for you? No. I, I think both would work. Um, I would, I would want to know for certain that bad content could not be distributed in any way, shape, or form. I mean, another example, just just this hasn't happened, but I could easily see it happening. Um, someone accidentally packages a file or an RPM with passwords in it, um, and you want those, I mean, you should just change the passwords, but that's not always easy. Um, or it could be external certificates that, that's not easy to, to remove. Um, so having the ability to remove that data and know that it's gone for good um, is useful. As to whether that is, as you say, just poisoning the artifact um, so the, it, the version is consistent, but you get bad data back, this package has been removed, whatever you want to call it. Um, but pointing back to the same artifact, I I don't have a personal preference one way or the other. Um, it does sound like if you're able to identify the artifact, then attacking the artifact directly and leaving the versioning leaving the versions alone is probably a cleaner solution. Um, it just depends on where you really care about something being um, immutable. Yep, and in the event that, um, like for example, it did go the other way. I, I suspect actually over time both of these will be end up being made. But um, in the case like where we only had the search and destroy, going to delete all your repository versions in order to get this malware out of your system, um, and actually deleting the content, you know, the RPM package itself as well. Like Pulp's like, oh, I don't have that never anymore. Um, I mean, that that could delete potentially a lot of your version history. It, is that yeah. acceptable? Is that is that a significant concern? For me, no. Uh, I think where it would cause a significant consternation is when it, we've got both a A and B release that's going concurrently, and we've got to work out how to delete it 
from both of those and maintain the versioning history. Um, that I could, just thinking about the, the code that I put in, that could be a bit of an effort um, to be able to, to do that. Um, and, and just walking everything forward. Um, but for other people that maybe we're quite lucky, we don't have boxes pegged on really old releases, but I could imagine other organizations will have that um, and that could cause issues. Cool, thank you so much. Um, and uh, do you have a test, like a pre-production, like do you have like a staging system for Pulp where you test upgrades prior to uh, um, upgrading your production systems? Not, not an ideal one. So we've got one that will just give us functional changes. So we've got a test suite that we wrote that basically goes through the tooling um, and make sure that when we create release, the expected content is copied across, that our reports look the way we expect them to look. Um, but we don't have anything that would pick up on performance issues um, or anything along those lines. Thank so you yeah, very much. we do have a test platform um but it's very much in a local dev context cool that's great and you can apply a pulp update there before you roll it out to all your bridge servers yes yeah and right. they, we can create it destroy it other people can spin up their own local testing environments it's all based in and around lexd images um so it's very easy to spin up and collapse um Perfect. and Prior to that, our RPM build infrastructure will spin up a mini pulp instance within the RPM build context and make sure that things start as expected. Perfect. Thank you so much. Any final questions for Douglas? This has been great, Douglas. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, it's not thank you very entirely much. selfless. I think <laughs> it's quite useful for you guys to know how I use it. <laughs> Excellent. So thanks, Emeline. I am just going to stop the recording.